Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schindler here on Drum Talk TV with another very fun interview. I'm in Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix, up in the mountains. Be sure to chime in, tell us where you're watching from. And our first time hazing victim, I mean guest, Josh Griffin is coming to us all the way on the other side of the equator in Brisbane, Australia. We were just talking that I actually lived there for a little while, and he's with a great band that's new to me. We'll talk about their history, but new to me, Caliglia's Horse. And I am taking a deep dive on you guys because when we got the press release and I watched a couple of videos, I, I'm totally sprung on you guys. Welcome. How are you? I'm amazing. Absolutely amazing. Hot. It is hot over here at the moment. We're about to hit, uh, we're in the beginning of a nasty heat wave, but oh, I'm no. fantastic. How hot is it? <laughs> Um, so it looks like it's going to be getting to about 37, 38 degrees Celsius over oh, here wow. today. That so, is hot. That yeah. was close to about 102, I think, Fahrenheit, I right think, around there. I think that's yeah. about the conversion. I'm, I'm absolutely atrocious at maths, which is kind Great of funny for a, for a drummer. drummer I write. <laughs> well, it is, <laughs> right? Kidding. You know, if someone throws you in a, a subdivision, you just go, oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Um, real, like I said, real excited to have you, and we're going to talk about the band. We're going to talk about your musical journey. We'll talk about this wonderful new album. We'll talk about a particular and show, particular video, while you kind of unpack the story of the song, and I'll give my story of when I first saw this video. And then uh, we'll show you uh, banging around a bit on a kit. We'll mm -hmm. show that. So I think where I want to start is and, and your website I've never seen, I'm going to show this first. I've never seen so many iterations of an album come out at the same time in different uh, medium formats. It's really intriguing. And the name of the album is Charcoal Grace. So it's going to cover both of us up, but I'm going to show the website and scroll through it. So there it is, folks. The really cool thing about this is, A, there's these three videos. And the first one, Storm Chaser, I'll show while Josh unpacks the song, but I literally got the chills watching this and I didn't even watch the whole thing. I, I hit it right <laughs> at the scary part. I said, that's it. I'm out. And I, I, I won't <laughs> give it away. Maybe I'll show up to that part. We'll see. We'll see. And then, but check this out. So we've got the gatefold black two LP, but that's not all. We've got the apricot colored two LP gatefold. That's not wow. all. We've got the bone gatefold 2lp and then we've got the light blue so there you go oh but wait there's more we've got the coke bottle green transparent and then we've got the sea blue what inspired such an amazing assortment i because can i tell you before you answer the first thing that came to my mind was hmm. when <laughs> you're probably too young to know when this happened when it happened but back in my day when <laughs> in through the outdoor came out in a brown paper wrapper hiding one of several different album covers by Led Zeppelin for In Through the Outdoor, where it was a scene shot from, I think, six different vantage points, and he didn't know which copy you were buying. So people okay, bought a is... bunch of them to try. I kind of thought of that. I thought, is this so that people will collect the different iterations? And are they mastered <laughs> differently? Is it, is it just the cosmetic? What's the deal, man? It's so intriguing. Uh... First of all, how amazing is that um, Zeppelin cover? Um, uh, that that is such a fascinating concept. Yeah, I really love that. It's kind of like what they appeal to in the nerd geek culture with um, blind bags and pop figures and things like that. Sometimes yeah. you don't know what you're going to get. And I love that. Yeah. So it's like being married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, bang on, right? Um, the the thing with the the different vinyl colors is actually courtesy of our record label inside out um they love offering different color options for different territories and it's it's a big part of um i mean it's absolutely for collecting but i just i love the idea that each territory will get a unique color specific yeah. to them and i i think that makes it a really um it makes it a really special and unique experience you know not only are you engaging with the music not only are you engaging with the artwork and i mean we all not love how i grew up in the vinyl era as well so there's nothing like having the full gatefold open and you're obsessing uh, over the lyrics and the uh, liner notes and the who, art who that wrote you what see. yeah that's it. and i i still love that and i i love that 
a coloured vinyl. Yeah. Really, it almost enhances that. You know, I, I have a very vivid memory. Again, when I was much younger, I was given a copy of uh, Synchronicity by the police. And it's one of my favorite. It's in my like top 10, 20 albums of all time. I adore oh, nice. that album. But I had a translucent red vinyl. Ooh. And my little, my little fragile brain had never seen anything like that. It was always black vinyl, standard, standard vinyl. And to see that was just like, oh, okay, that's really cool. Cute. Wait, wait, I got to ask. Up. When you got it, come on, Josh, come <laughs> clean. Did you hold it up to the light and look through it? Yeah. Of course I did. I do, I do that with all kinds of one stuff. Get... Like Christmas. Yeah. Like, hey. I just want to see what it looks like. I'm a <laughs> curious person like we all are. I yeah. do it with our, with our translucent vinyl that we get. Yeah. I always like to have a look and go, what does the world look through my, my vinyl, my yeah. album? It's fantastic. But, yeah, it really does. Um, it's back to the collection. It's back to the experience of that. You know, streaming is such an important part of our culture and, and music listening habits right now. But... I really think that um, vinyl coming back the way it has, it's 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 not quite niche. I don't think it's still I agree. a specific pocket of people, but that's expanding exponentially with Big all time. new artists are releasing, you know, vinyl versions yeah. um, of of their their new materials. So I I love that collection aspect. I love the unique experience of being able to hear that. And, you know, the cool color is amazing. Our previous album, Rise Radiant, we were able to pick like a a yellowy gold color. Ooh, neat. And my, I, I'm half joking, half serious about this. I wanted it so I could literally say I had a gold record. I love it. Yeah, Do it for the bit. That's good enough. <laughs> I'm going to ask you another question while I show that again, pull it up and scroll through it. Um, one of my questions with all this assortment of the different final iterations, is there a chance that Inside Out after a while might put out a box set where people can get all of them in any territory? I don't know. That's actually a really, really fascinating concept. Nothing we've ever really considered. I mean, I, I implore anyone who's into that kind of thing and wanting a box set, hit up Inside Out, bombard them yeah, because, with questions. Can you make this happen? Yeah, from a marketing and sales standpoint, the reason I thought of that was I thought at first when I saw those different flavors, will people sell them on eBay and whatnot to make them collectors for people in different regions to get the different ones. And then I thought, well, why not inside out and the band make that money by packaging mm -hmm. it that way. So you can get yeah. it, you know, I think that would be the way to do it. Oh, uh, I, I the do pirates. love the idea. Absolutely. I said, there's something about me. It tickles me quite well that people would be, you know, selling a, a green or whatever color of our vinyl of our yeah. record to someone on eBay, like, I don't want anyone getting ripped off, but there's a, there's a little part of me that tickles, that strokes the ego a bit. Yeah. No, and it's very <laughs> cool. It's, it's neat that you have a product that is really potentially very collectible like that. And sonically, the music's great, but sonically, have you compared the difference to the vinyl version to a digital or CD version? I don't even know if there's a CD version, but is that, mm. is the vinyl maintaining that old analog warmth that historically people just love. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, we very specifically master a vinyl version, um, of, have a vinyl master and a digital CD master, things like that. Because right. it's very important. You know, Sam, our guitarist, our producer, our literally everything and fearless band leader, he cares so much because he's an engineer and he's a producer as well. He cares so much about that product that he puts a lot of time in making sure that we're getting that you, you are getting the warmth. You're getting the very specific um, artifacts and nature of listening to music on vinyl, as opposed to what you get when it's heavily compressed in a digital version. And even like a CD version, you know, the CD version is kind of the one that we all are usually used to yeah. in that particular format. But um, no, it's not just a slapdash, get it on a vinyl, press it, get it out there. There's, we do take great care in that. And, that also comes down to sequencing as well. When we mm. look at sequencing for an album, we're very particular about the the flow, the natural flow of the album in general, but then we have to take a vinyl in consideration. You know, is it, do we have, is it a short enough album that it's going to be a side A and side B? No, we're a prog band. Of course it's not going to be. Right. You know, it's always going to be double. And um, 
you know, a very particular th thing came up with this. The the centerpiece of the album, um, the title track, Charcoal and Grace, which is a 24-minute suite mm -hmm. of four separate parts, we had a choice in the, um, the, the sort of production phase of vinyl. They said we can't fit we can't really fit all of this onto one side. We can, but it, we might have to, like the grooves are smaller for the yeah, vinyl. Yeah, they'd be so really tight. They are really tight. Um, or we split the suite down the middle, have a natural fade out and fade back in on, on, the, on the next side. And we, we actually were considering that for a little while. But then like we, a passion the, again, play by Jethro Tull did that. That's exactly yeah. right. Like it's been done before, but we also – there was something about the listening experience of the suite. We we wanted people to be able to experience it from beginning to end. And if vinyl's their preferred listening method, we wanted to give it to them. So again, there's so many different variables when you're considering your vinyl product, but then we want to make sure that the, the experience of listening to the album isn't necessarily hamstrung by, oh, up we get, flip it over because you're in the experience yeah. and the atmosphere of the piece. So yeah. Awesome. Um, I want to show that video, Storm Chaser, and it will, I don't think, start from the very beginning. I think I queued it up. Yeah, I queued it up for, and I'll give a, a little teaser. I queued it up for right after the guy cuts his finger. Okay. Oh, I'll, yeah. I'll leave it at that. And um, I'm going to start it from there and it's going to play on my side, cover me up while you kind of talk about the concept of the song while the video plays. So I'm starting right from when the girl puts the knife back into the rack at the sink and then uh, I'll, I'll chime in with the word chills the first time and each time I got the chills when I watched this video. And I then we'll talk what about the, the art direction and, and everything, the cinematography, it's really done well. So it's all yours. Tell us about this song, Storm Chaser. Well, the Storm Chaser was really born out of, um, musically it was born out of our guitarist, songwriter Sam and our bass player Dale. Um, Sit, hitting writing session with a blank slate. There was nothing in mind. And the they call it like the Tears for Fears, Everyone Wants to Rule the World-esque groove, but more of a halftime. And we're Chills. playing with those really... Gels, there it is. Is That that might be the crone, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, the appearance. <laughs> yeah, and now he's... No, actually, she's about to run through the trees. She just started going through ah, the trees and yes. that accelerated my chills but go go on <laughs> <laughs> but yeah that and that that's where the con the, the musical concept came from jim came up our singer sort of came up with the lyrics it it, it was born out of if you remember we're deep in the pandemic and we just started seeing some really for lack of a better word crappy behavior from people if it came from you know fighting tooth and nail over toilet paper yeah. you know and it was just it was such a fascinating thing for jim to explore this idea that something that was traumatic for the entire planet has caused a lot of people to to kind of turn on each other in our time of need and yeah. that's kind of the that's kind of the essence of what lyrically what the song and thematically what the song is about the um the fight or flight kind of instinct that we have that's ex that's exactly right and i mean that's kind of a literal translation with what we're seeing with our actress in here she's yeah She's literally flying away from something quite horrible, you know. And I cut it right mission. after he falls out of the boat. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. People, you got to see it. Go on the website. It's great. But it's please. Yeah. Um, we actually we we got in contact with a, um, a cinematographer and a director, Simon, and he um, he actually pitched us this this horror tinged themed um interpretation of the themes of of the song and we were really enamored with it it, few, it went through a few different um iterations of course but it was um i'm a horror buff i'm a big horror fan so this really oh, you tickled and steve got to talk some more he's a horror novelist oh yeah we're talking oh, about goodness. steve schinder folks our producer and our my youngest He's eight I'm years old, good. but he does, no, he's 29. <laughs> yeah, you guys got to talk, seriously. I, okay, I'm in. Yeah, no, horror is one of my favorite genres for sure, and I need to read some of his stuff. I'm excited. And, yeah, he Simon sort of came back with this um, with, with this concept, and um, we, we all latched onto it, you know, immediately. Mm -hmm. We kind of loved this idea that we were doing almost like a Kubrickian Oh, kind yeah. of um, slow burn horror. It, it wasn't supposed to be um, 
you know, jump scares build in your face. We went for a little, it's a little jolt. In there for sure. you, yeah. Yeah. You know, there's that creeping dread that Kubrick did in the shining so well that to this day, when I watch that film, I still feel like a slight panic about to hit because my heart's racing. I know what's coming, <laughs> but it's the sense of dread that he, that he really puts in. And that's something that we wanted to try and translate through here. So we got the pitch, we fell in love with it. And seeing it in action, you know, sometimes narrative clips can be a little bit, uh, you know, they can be a little bit cheesy. Maybe the concept doesn't quite come through or maybe the acting doesn't quite work. And we struck gold with our actors. Um, yeah. Bo and Corinne, they were absolutely fantastic. The pace of it with the music is just yeah. perfect. It really and is. And that, that was, that was um, again, Simon really understood that as well. I think the atmosphere of the song, because it is, it's a very atmospheric song. We do a lot of atmosphere in our music, but this is probably the most experimental and kind of exploratory that side that we've actually taken to the atmosphere there's not a lot of guitar you know yeah. there's a big focus in our band it's got a kind of 12-8 shuffle-ish kind of groove to it which is that's one of our mo's you know we love ourselves a 12-8 purdy shuffle um i love it it's my favorite groove of all time oh, and cool. i will take anyone on that one if you can get it and get it right yeah nothing feels better nothing feels greater and um yeah, so sort of have this this clip, this interpretation of the clip. It wasn't a literal translation of the lyrics. It was just like, I'm going to take a couple of the themes and then have his own idea of it and come out with that was phenomenal. I remember seeing the first, we, we saw the first cut and we were just losing our minds over it. Like, this is absolutely fantastic. It's interesting On the day, how married it is to the music and the song without yeah. it being an exact interpretation. Yeah, and I because that that kind of hits a gag reflex for us. We don't want a literal translation of of our lyrics and our themes because you know I think a certain ambiguity is really important yeah. for the listener or the viewer to really take. They make their own mind up. They have their own interpretations and translations. We've had people talk to us at the merch desk on different tours, be like, I thought this song was about this. And you're like, that's really interesting. And we'll all talk about it backstage going, hey, someone was telling me that this is what they thought about a particular song. And that may not have been Jim's intention with it, but it's really awesome to see what, what people take from it. Yeah. And yeah, to, to hit such a, um, like you said, it really marries together so well. And I, I, I I adore it. I really adore it. It's the first time that I've seen an, or in a long time I've seen a narrative clip that doesn't hit a cheese factor yeah. that really commits to the atmosphere, commits to the vibe. And again, there's there's that scent. There's a creeping dread that goes through the entire clip. Yeah, that's awesome. It's beautiful. You guys got to check it out. It's on the website. One last note on horror. I got to brag about Steve. He's got two novels. Horror, comedy, fantasy, really, really good stuff. I think you would totally dig it. Um, I'm in. Yeah, so there you go. And you're connected with Steve, so he'll hook yep, you up, I, give I you the links. Oh, I am so keen to give those a read. I've got a 17 hours of flight coming up. And, there you um, go. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, in fact, Steve, put in the link and pin to the comments, please put the video link to um, Storm Chaser so that people could just see it and then Folks, go check out the website. Steve will put that in as well. Um, I want to show a short video of you playing that'll also play on just my side. I think it might cover both of us, but it's uh, it's of you playing during a rehearsal. And then let's jump into I got a couple gear questions, and then we'll talk drumming and your musical journey. And then we'll absolutely uh, get back to the band. Let's see where are we? Where, where did I? Who took my? Oh, there it is. Okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> check this out, folks. Oops, let me turn the uh, volume up. I had it down for that other video. So there you get to see the miming. Love that syncopation. <laughs> what what's the symbol set up on that kit? I know that was just a mobile phone video, but it still sounds. Each of them had like their own. Hope this comes out okay. Like their own tone of thrash, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You know. What I, I mean? um. 
Yeah, I, I have a bit of an aversion to um, too many bright, too much brightness in my symbols. Like I do love the murky. I do love something that's a bit more trashy. Um, mm. The my left crash is actually a um, a minor vintage jazz eighteen, oh, and wow. it's. I remember, like we we were when we were recording the album, we went through a whole bunch of different um, crash symbols and. Again, it was just this, it's such a short sound. It's really trashy. It's a very unconventional sort of sound yeah. that you would expect for a big prog metal rock slash production. Yeah. Um, but I really love that kind of effect. My right is a 19-inch um, minor polyphonic crash. Oh, and I, I was actually initially looking at their medium-thin crash, which is kind of, it's a, it's a nice big, it's not too meaty, it's, it's kind of thin, medium-thin, but it just, it allows you to crash on it without overpowering everything and couldn't get a hold of it, sat in a room, hit the polyphonic, and I'm like, okay, that's my, that's my main big crashy crash. Sure. Um, but again, it's, it's not, I, I find that the Byzance range is, they, they straddle that line really well between having it has a certain brightness that you want from a symbol, but it it's enough murk and dark on there that it, it allows you to cut through and gives you a nice different tone. Um, the China was just, I picked up a classics custom oh. and it's, it's, it's fantastic. Like I, when I was playing a lot of Sabian symbols, the Holy China is one of the pinnacle, I think of, of China symbols. It's short, fast and loud as hell. Yeah. And that really, I think that really works well in our context. But, you know, picking up the, the Classics Custom, it's a fantastic sound. The, the stack, it is an old broken china, um, just the, sitting the right way as a china should. Yep. And I've got an X-hat attachment that I've just got a broken crash that I sit on top. Oh, so cool. it's, it's like a really oversized, dirty, trashy, chinery hi-hat, really, yeah, yeah. that I use as my main stack. And again, because you can sort of control how much sizzle you've got on it. So, yep. you know, for some stuff, I kind of want a little bit more washy, whereas what you saw in the video, it's, it's attack. It's right. nothing but attack. That's awesome. So when did you start playing drums and why drums? And do you play other instruments? I can play a little guitar, a little piano, but that was basically self-taught. I am, it's a cliche, but I just naturally gravitated towards drums when I was much younger. I have memories of sitting there watching, of all things, the Little Shop of Horrors film oh. from the 80s with pots and pans and playing along. I underst I had kind of like a, a natural understanding of drum kit placement, how grooves would work. I would watch countless music videos and live clips where possible. Um, and I kind of just learned that way, you know, and it was just through listening to hundreds of thousands of hours of music That's and awesome. just absorbing it all. Um, but as, yeah, basically self-taught until I got to about year 10 in high school and then I had a wonderful teacher, uh, Chris Scott, his name was. Um, he was uh, a very, very, very traditional sort of drummer in that way, but he really taught me the, um, the idea of being versatile, mm. you know, not just being, I could be a little bit snobby, snobby uh, when it came to certain genres of music and certain styles. I wouldn't open my mind up to say funk or jazz or anything like that. It was just like, I'm going to play rock and metal. Let's go. And then you and fell well, in love with great. synchronicity. Yeah, that, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, that was always in the background. And you know, if without him, I wouldn't have fell in love with something like a shuffle. You know, everyone knows Rosanna by Toto. So yeah. if if there's one song that introduced me to what that was and to a lot of other funk drumming, that was a gateway into that side. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that I just remember him saying, stay versatile. That was the one thing he kept drumming into me, <laughs> pun. Um, he really, really hammered that into me just to be as versatile as possible. And Look, I forgot that for a little while. You know, you get to late teens, early 20s, you think you know everything, you think you're an amazing musician, you play, you beat the crap out of everything, you break everything in sight. <laughs> and then, you know, you're poor, you can't afford new symbols, everything breaks, everyone's complaining. And then you go, oh, okay, maybe I should <laughs> chill out a little bit. 
but yeah, I I just that was my sort of beginnings. It was the, it's a cliched story. It was pots and pans. A big thing that I did though, and this is it used to be a bit of a secret shame for me. I won't I won't lie, but I would air drum. I would air drum in my room. You know, you see air guitarists do their thing, but I I had this kind of thing where. Again, I knew where drum placement was. So yeah. I'd sit on the little chair in my room, put music on, and I would just mime the parts as mm-hmm. to a setup, whatever the drummer I was listening to. So if it was Dave Grohl, it was Big Tom's Big Simple Placement. If it was something like, say, um, Jimmy Chamberlain from the Smashing Pumpkins, I'd hoard and obsessed over live videos. So I would visualize what his kit would look like and just approximate and play. And that's how I learned everything that I could play. And it was oh, just by right. listening and doing that. Um, and you were using I... visualization as well, you yeah. know, and then yeah. mo- bringing that into a kinesthetic action, which is really cool. Mm. And it's funny, I'd never really thought about it uh, is that I was doing that until obviously many years later. And, you know, as my wife was, and I were talking about it and she said a very similar thing. She's like, it's, it's a, I don't know how unique it is. I'm sure other people do it, but it was something that I'm like, I, I shouldn't be ashamed of this idea that I was air drumming in my right. room because I actually got a lot of benefit from that. It made me a better musician. It actually helped develop my ear in that way because mm-hmm. I was listening to you so much. And, you know, any musician, doesn't matter what instrument you play, if they're worth their weight, they should be able to get into a musical situation with a band or a session, whatever they're doing, and just be able to follow their musical instincts so yeah. i really developed that as a result so you know it, it it had a tremendous amount of benefits and then of course that the problem with that is that i've got no resistance so i'm literally having to pull my own punches so yeah. developing a lot of hand strength and arm strength but when i translated that to a kit i was no sense of dynamics so i was be- beating the ever-loving crap out of them <laughs> I sounded good, but it was nothing but 127 velocity every yeah. single time I sat behind a kit. And the good news is, though, while you were learning all your music that way, your air drums never drowned it out what you were listening to. That's exactly right. <laughs> That's exactly right. Nowadays, i got any monitors. I can destroy my hearing right. in a much more controlled environment. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it, was, it was super helpful. And, you know, like... That, and that, that came from different styles as well. I wasn't just, you know, it was early days. It was Guns N' Roses. It was Metallica, like Black Album Metallica, I mean, and yeah. and Nirvana and all that sort of stuff. I get into mid-high school and you, you're supposedly a depressed, you know, emotional teenager. <laughs> and I have a friend introduce me to the Smashing Pumpkins, like I mentioned before. And yeah. I love the music. I thought it spoke to me in some way, but it was Jimmy Chamberlain's drumming that made me sit up and say hello because I'd never heard alternative rock drumming mixed with a kind of jazz slash fusion ideology yeah. into it. And that really made me sit up and pay attention. And that's neat. Yeah. It, it's, um, you know, I'm listening to all this music. My mum's like, Oh, he's, he's depressed and he's suicidal. I'm like, no, the drums are just really cool. <laughs> <laughs> now you, you mentioned, you know, the blessing you got from your teacher teaching about versatility. When you think about what you gleaned from that, Give us a few examples of some artists that you really love that are away apart from each other that kind of transcend that versatility that you developed with your with your ear and your musical taste. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, again, I I, I would definitely say I mentioned things like Toto. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of led me on a path to, to explore some funk and sort of R and B type stuff. That so makes you know, sense. I yeah, you know, yeah. you dive Especially into the older to stuff. discovering. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, diving into things like um, Tower of Power, you know, learning oh, how to yeah. play. Dave First Gatt time I heard you. what is hip, you know, I'm like, what's going down there? And the little <laughs> fill that he does, yeah. it's such a simple fill, but it's so effective and it's so damn funky. You get the stank phase when you hear it. Yeah. Um, but it was even things like, you know, I ventured down to some singer-songwriter stuff. So Sarah McLaughlin is one of my favorite um, singer-songwriters. I adore her music. Again, her drummer at the time was, it, it was, it always fit the needs of the song. And, mm-hmm. you know, I went down that path. As I've gotten older, I discovered um, a little bit more of that left field fusion um, type material. So I don't mm. know if you've heard of uh, Tigran Hamasayan, the piano player. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he does some really incredible things with, with jazz and fusion. He's a jazz pianist, but his sense of 
rhythm and it's 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 so it's so very different if, if that makes sense you know yeah. he's exploring some really complex rhythms and syncopation in some really wacky time signatures but it, it also feels very soulful it's very melodic and it's also very jarring but i love that combination um his drummer drummer arthur uh Hnetic, i think his yeah. name is a, yeah he is he is a sensational drummer so yeah. you know i kind of spread far and wide to that you know I, even a very seminal album in that time that i was air drumming in my mid-teens was harry Connick jr and oh. the album was she yeah yeah i have that I, that's a great album I, it's a yeah, my, it's actually my wife's album. album but it's great i love harry's work. oh yeah man it, it's so funky it yeah. was so funky. I learned a lot from that because there's so many different drummers on that album too. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's Zigaboo plays on the, the opening title track. Yeah. And it's like, it's funk, but it's power. And then a few songs later, you've just got, you can just, in, I imagine just this dude sitting there on a really simple setup, barely moving his arms. Cigarette, all in the cigar. Hands, <laughs> and he's just, I, I actually, I'm just visualizing. A bowler hat. Here. <laughs> yeah it, I'm just, it's basically Bernard Purdy right just yeah without the oh right. you know <laughs> but that was that's such a seminal album for me in um in sidestepping from the the rock and the metal and alternative rock and things like that was very different phrasing very different styles and even different ways of hitting even though it took me a long time to kind of filter that out into my playing i i underwent a fairly significant change in my style a so i wouldn't break symbols and things but also playing in certain live situations you're not always going to be playing to a big room with a big pa it's yeah you know at a bar somewhere where people just want to have a drink and dance to your music they don't want to get pummeled yeah. with five splashes and a china that's you know louder than what the pa is actually pumping out <laughs> unmiked <laughs> yeah unmiked i still I, look, I to be fair we've played some rooms with caligula's horse over the years where our sound guy will come up and just be like i'm not marking your symbols tonight and i'm not really hitting that that hard but right. he's like but forget the overhead forget the overheads we don't need them yeah. you good okay let's go <laughs> that's great so talk about the name of the band josh where where'd the name of the band come from for those who don't know the history of that so um this is actually before my time full disclosure i joined a, a number of years into the band's um existence mm -hmm. but sam it, it started out as a solo project for sam valen and it was just an opportunity for him to write what he wanted to write without any confines any other songwriters in the process and it was just a, it allowed him to really well show off his play like, almost preternatural guitar skills, mm -hmm. but just really experiment with form and, and phrasing and structure and things like that. I really loved it. The, the name is obviously, um, if you don't know the story, Caligula, the emperor, he put his horse in Cetitis in a position of power. Right. And, you know, the, the the Jim and Sam when they kind of started working together they when the name was there they loved the idea that it's this it's sort of a, a representation of in, you're in over your head yeah, you know sometimes yeah. you know you feel like a bit of a collegial source you are literally in a situation where you probably shouldn't be and you're yeah. in so far over your head and you just kind of hope to God that you it'll work out you'll be fine right right <laughs> so yeah. it's a, it's it's a it's a great play on it that is. um that idea yeah that's awesome. So I got to ask you this, what is the, your favorite concert that you've ever been to that you weren't playing in? Oh, oh I've, there's, there's a couple, I'm going to, I'm going to cheat and give a couple of answers. Okay. That's okay. They're kind of seminal moments. I um, have a very, I don't know if you've heard of a band Crowded House. Yeah. 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 You know Crowded I'm House? From so, the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. I saw them. I was very young. I was going to say, were you, you this five? Is, like, yeah, would have been a. But this is their very first tour as well. Yeah, wow. After they formed, and I have a very distinct memory of being on my uncle's shoulders, watching them play. Wow. And um, I, how formative such was a, that for you? Well, just just in terms, I as a concert going experience, it was fantastic. You know, I'm in a, I, I'm that young, I'm at a live venue watching this band. Obviously, at that point in time, there was still 
in their very outlandish, leery, bright colored suits. And had and one of the biggest bit... MTV videos at the time. Yeah. Back yeah, when MTV that's... played music videos. <laughs> <laughs> this is reality shows, right? Yeah, at the moment. Yeah, but and they the had a huge, that huge hit. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, I've never, forgot, I always come back to that band because there, there's, there's, it's rare when you get so many songs from one band that give you goosebumps. Yeah. And they always, they always manage to make me feel something. And even at that young age, you know, I might not have been entirely aware of what I was experiencing and hearing, but it really, um, it, give, it gave me a sense of melody, if I can be perfectly honest That's with you, because, you know, Neil Finn writes incredible melodies yeah. and, you know, they're quite sophisticated, but they're presented in such a way that it's, it sounds so simple and so effortless. And again, these are things that I think I've sort of had to, they've been in my subconscious, they've been in my system for so long. And as I've kind of evolved my songwriting, you, you just, you, you know, these little things come back to you. You know, yeah. we have a joke that we call him, uh, um, Uncle Uncle Neil Neil Finn, the the lead singer and songwriter, because yeah. I don't think he writes a bad melody, and hence hence why we um, on our twenty twenty album Rise Radiant, one of the bonus tracks was a Neil Finn song uh, called "Message to My Girl," nice. and the the melody, sort of the opening melody, is this really haunting piano piece. But then you get to this this chorus that is the most. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it now. I can hear it in my head. It, it's uplifting in in its in its chord change where it goes to, but the melody he sings it once it's in it's an earworm you will never forget yeah, it. And, and so that's that very piece, seminal. When did that piece come out, Josh? Uh, Message to my girl, the original. Yeah, uh, would have been I think eighty two. Okay, because I think he played that when I saw Neil Finn on a solo tour in what must have been two thousand three or four. <laughs> Between yeah. 2002 and four, somewhere in there at the, uh, when there was a house of blues on sunset in Hollywood, it's no longer there. And I mm. saw him then. I think he played that. He did play some mm. old stuff as well as like stuff from a brand new album that he had at the time. He was great. Uh, and it's, and that's like, he's written so, just so many incredible songs, so many catchy songs, so many just important songs, I think. And that's, it's always stuck with me, but that sense of melody, you know, I, it, it comes out from time to time where, you know, it, the, the little flash of, of inspiration comes from and you go, yeah, it's probably something like that. So it really informed that. Later on, um, this is slightly on the heavier side, I got to see Pantera. Um, it was their very <laughs> yeah. last tour in Australia before, sadly, Dimebag was, yeah. um, was killed. And, you know, I was freshly 18, which is our legal drinking age over here. So I definitely, um, definitely had a good night, but it was, it was so intense. It was so powerful, but it was my first real metal crowd. And I was a bit terrified. I'm not going to lie. I was very terrified. Really? Yeah. I just, you know, there was a lot of um, mean looking people. Yeah. Um, and those are just the I, girls. I, that's exactly <laughs> right. They will beat me. I, I had hair back then as well. So you know, you have the usual push. And again, yeah. these were a band, this was a band that I'd listened to for so long. And I was getting an opportunity to see them. This was really, really cool. I'd learned a lot from Vinnie Paul, their drummer, in terms of metal drumming. Yeah. Um, uh, I loved that. And, um, get, you know, bumping into someone, you're a little bit drunk, you're having a really good time. And there's this dude that's probably about, you know, seven foot something or other <laughs> shirtless he's Sasquatch. built he's jacked right yeah. he's covered in tats and i bumped into him and i looked up and i went uh oh i might be in trouble and he looked at me and he goes yeah and starts headbanging i'm like <laughs> then you got it okay yeah this is where it, i am it really is these are my people yeah. these are absolutely my people i um, saw i saw pantera open for um Black Sabbath when Ian Gillen was with them for that one album, Born Again, <laughs> the Born Again <laughs> tour. I saw them open for them. They were so loud, I couldn't hear them. They weren't yeah. the loudest band that I've heard, but they were so loud that it all just mushed together. And I felt bad because I looked around the arena. It was at like Long Beach Arena, I think, which is big. Mm. And I, I thought, is it, can, is it just me or can everyone else make out what's going on here? It was really <laughs> kind of weird. It must have been where I was sitting or something. I don't know. 
Oh, uh, you never know. But look, they were a loud band. It was very noisy. Yeah. See, and see, Pantera are really important because they were they were a metal band, but they called themselves like a power groove metal band. Yeah, yeah. Dimebag's riffs and Vinnie Paul's pl- drumming were just they were so symbiotic to each other. Yeah, and it was all groovy. No one wrote a riff like Dimebag, yeah. as far as I'm concerned. Like it, he was one of the most creative riff writers out there because it wasn't a standard metal riff it was here's a standard metal riff but also let's add all of the extra cool stuff in there and it's such a vibe so again kind of forms my opinion of what um metal was Interesting. you know what i mean that was your context your point of reference really yeah absolutely and look at th- this is this is very um this is more of a personal uh, one for me after I discovered Dream Theater and Mike Portnoy and how much he influenced my playing, I went on a deep dive through a lot of bands that he had talked about over many years. And there's a Swedish progressive metal band called Pain of Salvation. I don't know if you've heard of them. I have not, no. They're, um, they're, they're fantastic. Very, um, it's very dark. It's very, um, and again, being progressive, label as progressive allows them to kind of just do whatever they want. There's no real singles ne- there necessarily. It's yeah. just really exploratory, inventive songwriting. And my very first European tour with Caligula's Horse back in 2017, we, we called it the Cheese Tour because we were doing a couple <laughs> of support sh- slots with them. We had um, a couple of amazing festivals to play throughout Europe and we did a couple of opening su- uh, main supports with OPEF. And so, you know, the rest of it was just driving through amazing countries, eating a lot of cheese. <laughs> I, I have no issue with that. If so there's one thing I love about I touring. That. That's funny. Yeah, that's it. Oh, no, we, we ended up at a So what's place, your favorite cheese? Blue cheese. Me too. Blue, still love blue cheese. anything in that yep. family. Yeah. A- anything that's got a nice stink to it that's yeah. going to make me go, woof. Yeah. That's, uh, um, I, that's I, my I vibe. I love it. I love it. Yeah. That's no, absolutely. Are there any? The, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no. Um, but seeing we we got to play with Pain of Salvation, we landed in France, we played at Toulouse. I'd never experienced jet lag before, it hurt. Um oh. and we came off stage from our site. I don't remember the set. I remember starting it and I remember being outside at 8 30 in and it was daylight in the evening, going, Okay, we played a show, it was good. And then we cooled down, we went and watched the show, and this was a band that I never thought I'd actually get to see live again because they're not a hugely popular progressive metal band they're mm-hmm. very much a niche underground kind of band and here i was supporting them but watching them from the front of stage and it, it's uh, one of those that's cool one of those transcendental moments where you, you you're seeing these songs you i've been listening to for probably 10 years and i i remember looking at one of the guys in the band and we were both crying and you're like oh. okay yeah this is a really special moment that's neat that's cool and I was checking uh, the the frame rate and the stream and all that, and my tabs were showing at the top, folks. So if you're wondering what the heck that was, that's what that was. It was a window, and I couldn't shrink it down, so I just left it. Um, that's cool stuff. Um, so before we go, we're going to play a little game that's called the Josh Griffin Fun Fact Segment. And basically, this is so that people can get to know you outside of your musical life if that's okay to get at least a little peek beyond the curtain so i want to absolutely great what what do you like to do when you're not playing music you're not writing music you're not touring you're not rehearsing you're not recording what do you like to do that's completely away from music how do you i i'm a big film buff as i mentioned like a big horror fan but i'm a big film buff i love films um and I'm also a big, big gamer. I love my video games. Oh, really? What do you like to play? Um, I'm a I'm a big story uh, story games. I okay. love my story based games. So things like The Last of Us are uh, just incredible experiences. Um, Bioshock are some of my favorite ones. I'm not oh, wow. sort of stuck to particular things, but I, I suppose I am with um, the Dark Souls series and, and things like Elden Ring, for example. You know, the games that are intentionally brutally challenging, but you have this real sense of achievement when you spend three or four days trying to defeat one boss. And when you do it, yeah. you fist pump the air and you're like, Oh, okay. I kind of get it. And I've got my kids. I've got three. I've got three kids: uh, two teenagers and a ten-year-old. And oh, cool. I got I got the eldest two into them 
And, you know, if we're not sort of, you know, being family, going out and doing family things, that's us of an evening, you know, we'll, we'll have dinner, we'll hang out. And then my wife will usually be like, I'm going to go watch TV. You guys have fun. And we'll be doing challenge runs in these games. So we that's kind cool. of bond over that. And I've recently um, taken up Twitch streaming oh. as well. Oh, and with gaming? my kids have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just I just jump on there and game and engage with the chat. Nice. And my kids have sort of been jumping on with me from time to time as well. So it's been a really it's been really amazing in my position with the band to be able to ha again, like I said, peel back the curtain a little bit. Yeah. And open my home and my family up to some of the fans and people who subscribe. That's cool. and we have an absolute blast with it. That's awesome. Cool. Folks, you've got to check this album out. Charcoal Grace by Caligula's Horse. Check out the three videos. They are great. And check out, got to show it one more time. Check out all these different iterations. I'll pull it up here. This is on their website. Look at all these different versions of the album you can get. We'll start from the bottom. <laughs> you, they're all gatefold, two LP yeah. vinyl albums. You've got the sea blue. You've got the Coke bottle green, transparent. You've got the light blue. You've got the bone You've got the apricot. You've got the black, believe it or not. There's even black. In America, there used to be a <laughs> record store chain named after what we referred to vinyl albums as called Licorice Pizza. Yes, yes. I, I love that. That yeah. is such a fantastic expression. Old I love term, that so yeah, much. 60s yeah. and 70s, yeah. That's so cool. I great love that. having you on. Um, hang out for a moment when we're done, and i got to find that Phoenix date. Uh, the tour starts tomorrow, right? As we're recording. No, this, so the, the album. The, so the album comes um, out tomorrow. Album comes out tomorrow. Um, and we start in Washington, D.C. on the 31st. 31st is our first session. show. Next week, right around the corner. It's next week. It is like we're in, like, we've had our final rehearsals. We're in hack frantically, make sure we haven't forgotten our passports and get on a plane. Awesome. Cool. Folks, thank you so much for joining Josh and myself here on Drum Talk TV. Check them out. Great band, great music, great videos, great iterations of how you can buy the music as well. And stay tuned to everything going on with Drum Talk TV on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Vimeo, and Twitter, and our drumtalktv.com as well. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys.